The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, this is the first podcast of 2020. We are now entering our 10th year in producing this show, a 440 some odd episodes later. Uh, who knew that when we began this back in 2010, we would be here in 2020, uh, hundreds of episodes later, to continue the discussion about China-Africa relations? It's crazy. It's a real testament to, to obsession and, and you know, mental troubledness. It re- it's funny because when we started this show all those years ago, you and I had a conversation. We said, well, how many topics can there actually be for us to cover? So let's just do this for five or six months see where it goes, and lo and behold, here we are 10 years later. What we do at the beginning of the year every year is we do a look forward to see what's coming up. And so this is our forecast episode, 2020 being the year. Uh, What we're going to do is we have three topics each. Uh, I don't know what Kobus's topics are. He doesn't know what my topics are. We're going to go right through them. And the idea here is to be able to provide you with an outlook of what are some of the key issues. Now, I have to put a disclaimer in here. This is a relationship that has grown so much more complex and is evolving so much faster than it was 10 years ago when we started this and when we started doing this type of show, the forecast show. Back then, it was pretty easy. China's going to loan money. China's going to take some resources. China's going to build from infrastructure. That kind of was the theme for the first, I don't know, Kobus, what would you say, three, maybe four years up into the mid-2015, so so about then? It's changed a lot today. We have a much more multifaceted relationship, so we're going to pick some themes, but they are by no means definitive uh, because there are so much going on. So forgive us if we are leaving out a lot of different topics that should be addressed. Kobus, let's get started with your first theme for 2020. What do you think is the top story or trend that people should watch in the year ahead? I think this is a complicated trend, um, pulling together a whole bunch of, of different issues at the same time. For me, that, that, that issue is sustainable energy and energy provision as a whole. So Africa is really desperate for dependable electricity. It's it's one of its most fundamental challenges in in kickstarting development, um, and it's also pushing a lot of money into electricity. Um, so I recently read a report by the Infrastructure Consortium for Africa, which showed that of the about hundred billion dollars that's committed to African infrastructure at the moment, forty three percent is going into electricity. Um, and you know, I was speaking to to analysts. Um, at Super Return, which was a big investor conference, which was which took place in Cape Town last year, and they were saying that they can't think of a, of a single African country that isn't running some kind of solar or wind project at the moment. That said, um, you know, kind of the the, the Chinese obviously are leaders in, in sustainable energy, but they're also leaders in coal-powered energy. Um, and at the, at the moment, coal-powered energy is being pushed out of China. And there's, I see on the one hand a kind of alignment between Chinese companies who have a lot of coal capability, who might be interested in building more coal stuff along the Belt and Road as long as the going is good, you know, before coal is shut down completely. And you see old leaders in Africa. Um, you remember Africa is the world's youngest population with the world's oldest leaders. So some African countries are locked into coal. South Africa is a particular culprit in this, in this respect. Um, South Africa has a lot of coal and it wants to build a lot of coal-powered electricity no matter what. Um, So there is this kind of conflict between Africa needs sustainable and renewable energy in the future. China potentially could provide a lot of that. But there is a lot of, of... kind of vested interests pushing Africa and China in the direction of building more coal. Um, and we saw that all taking place in 2018, 2019, I mean, um, with a big lawsuit uh, around a coal-powered um, plant in Kenya, 
um, which was going to be built around uh, uh, very close to a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, the coal was supposed to be coming from South Africa. The, the plant was supposed to be financed by China. Um, and we saw it defeated. Like a, a coalition of NGOs and local communities took these, these actors and the Kenyan government to court and managed to kill the project or ostensibly kill the project. Um, so I think this, all, all of this together is a long-winded way of saying I think electricity is going to be one of the biggest issues. And the fight around what kind of electricity Africa is going to be locking itself into using Chinese money and contractors is going to be one of the big issues of 2020, I think. Listen, the bottom line is that power is the key development issue in Africa today. Without power, there's virtually nothing else is possible. And I think that's starting to come into the conversation on the development space more and more. As and I think the Chinese deserve a lot of credit here. As you've talked about, they are bringing in a lot of sustainable energy. So going back to Kenya, in Garissa, which is in northeastern Kenya, the Chinese brought online a 50 megawatt solar power plant facility, which is just spectacular when you look at the pictures of it. It's large, it's big. And what they did here, and this is why it's so important, is Garissa in northeastern Kenya was not on the national grid. And with this new 50 megawatt solar plant, they were able to connect that region, which had been off the grid, off uh, and that had not had stable power supplies, now get consistent electricity. And so up until now, it had been through thermal, uh, and that apparently was not consistent. And Kenya deserves a lot of credit as well, because they are moving very, very quickly to be an all-sustainable energy country, one of the few. Now, they are blessed with sun, they are blessed with geothermal, they're blessed with uh, some hydroelectric, and they've got a nice mix of all of that. So they're in a unique position here. That being said, as you pointed out, Kobus, elsewhere in Africa— uh, the Chinese are bringing coal-fired power plants, and that is disconcerting. However, if you speak with African stakeholders, they will say that the cost is a key criteria here. And fossil fuel energy still has a long future in Africa simply because they contend that the cost per megawatt is still cheaper with fossil fuels, particularly coal, than it is with renewable energy, say wind, water, or solar. So there is, as you pointed out, a very big appetite for fossil fuels, and particularly in places like Nigeria, that are so energy deficient, that when the Chinese come in and say, we'll build you a coal plant, we'll build you a solar plant, whatever you want to do, but when it comes down to the loans and financing it, sometimes the cheaper way will probably prevail. So it's a mixed bag here on the, the energy side, but certainly there's more headlines for the Chinese on the sustainable energy front, solar being a big one. What, what's your take on hydroelectric, though? Because the Chinese are instrumental in building dams across Africa. And the Inga 3 Dam, they are in a consortium to build that in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, they have built a number of hydroelectric dams. Environmentalists are of two minds on hydroelectric. On the one hand, it is not contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. But on the other hand, there is terrible environmental destruction associated with uh, in, uh, with hydroelectric. What's your thought on that? Yes, I, hydroelectric is definitely an option in the fight against carbon pollution. But as you say, it's expensive and it has a lot of um, a lot of negative impacts environmentally. The other thing is it's also very dependent on constant, on sustainable water supplies. Um, and if you're in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's not necessarily a problem, but in lots of other parts of Africa, it is a problem, especially in the face of climate change. You know, so so as, as a climate sustainable solution, it might not be as, as strong as solar or wind. That's a good point that you bring up on water supply, because in Zambia, Mozambique, uh, and certainly in South Africa, the droughts have been devastating this year and uh, so yes. far. And, and you've seen a situation where, in some cases, the, the, the levels of a river would sink, and then suddenly a city is out of power. That's exactly it. So, so that's a good cause, a good reason now, is that it, to, to maybe hesitate on hydroelectric in certain parts of Africa where water is an issue. Let's move on to our second, or our first topic, still my number one trend for 2020 or 2020 is going to be the U.S.-China-Africa relationship. Uh, this is going to be an absolutely 
pivotal year. We saw last year in 2019, uh, the U.S.-China relationship really came to overwhelm many parts of the diplomatic relationship between Africa and the rest of the world. Africa was oftentimes collateral damage in between the two great powers that were in a ongoing, simmering, brewing, I don't know how you want to describe it. Is it a trade war? Is it a trade spat? But it is trade tensions, and it's a broader tension in the relationship. And this year with the presidential election in the United States is going to be pivotal. So even though the U.S. and China today seem to have resolved at least parts of their trade dispute temporarily, we don't know if this is sustainable in the long term, but the phase one is technically done, that has eased things a little bit. Will it at the same time escalate again, depending on if President Trump is reelected for another term? I think Africa is really taking sides in many respects, even though it may not be in their best interest to do so. So your president, Cyril Ramaphosa, in 2019, Cobus, made it very clear, I think, that uh, he is aligning his foreign policy much more with Russia and China. And it seems, at least the optics, maybe not the substance, but the optics seem to be that he is giving a cold shoulder to the U.S. and to Europe, which is potentially very significant for South Africa, given that the balance of trade between the U.S. and South Africa is much healthier than it is between China and South Africa, where there's a huge trade imbalance that exists. So we will see the U.S.-China relationship have an impact across Africa, and how African countries position themselves in that, I think, will be a key story for this year. What's your take on that? I, I completely agree with you. I think it's going to be a very big issue. Um, and it, it has to do both with uh, with escalating tensions um, between China and the U.S. Um, and pressure occasionally, for example, during the Huawei um, campaign, or the anti-Huawei campaign from the U.S., pressure on African countries to, to choose sides. But I think the second impact is also just simply on the U.S. being quite distracted um, um, and Africa falling very relatively low on its, on its list of priorities, um, you know, particularly now that, that we've seen significant tensions between the U.S. and Iran um, and the U.S. being, being in full-on election year mode. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, there might be pressure on Africa to do, you know, to, to choose sides. On the other hand, it might simply, Africa might simply fall off the agenda, um, which then means that that uh, the U.S. embassies, U.S. diplomats on the continent are kind of stuck in a holding pattern waiting for the election while the Chinese are moving ahead, you know, very rapidly. So, so I think, th you know, both of those are going to have an impact this year. And consider the fact that the United States now appears to be repositioning significant uh, military assets out of Africa. Uh, and in, ironically, in order to confront China and Russia elsewhere around the world, uh, but Howard French, the acclaimed author and uh, journalist, he wrote recently in World Politics Review how the United States has long had a Pentagon-led or a military-led foreign policy in Africa, and now with that redeployment, it even pushes further down Africa in the priority scale in Washington. And that's a mistake, just as the, as the Chinese are now ramping up their engagement in Africa. So it comes in an interesting time when Prime Minister Wang, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi is going to make his first visit to of the year, which begins always in Africa. That's a tradition that the Chinese Foreign Minister takes. And at the same time, the news that of the U.S. disengaging, at least militarily in part, from Africa. So we start to, again, get back to these optics. But it does show in many respects how the United States is downplaying its overall engagement in Africa. And again, Kobus, do you expect to see much from the Prosper Africa initiative that was launched in Maputo last year? We haven't seen much come out of it. We're now seven, eight months into Prosper Africa timeframe. Uh, this would be the time when we see something. So if it's not the Pentagon that's going to lead American engagement in Africa, is it going to be the commerce? Is it going to be state? Is it going to be other part of the U.S.? new International Development Finance Corporation. Where are we going to see American engagement in Africa? I mean, if, if it is on this kind of developmental side, then that would be good news, I think, for Africa. Um, you know, the, this is the kind of engagement that Africa is, is very hungry for. Is, is, you know, it's real economic engagement that can lead to development. The, it seems to me that at the moment, the, 
the bandwidth doesn't seem to be there, you know, in, in, on the U.S. side in, in terms of um, in terms of just focusing resources and attention on on dealing with this with the implement, implementation of of the the Prosper Africa plan. Um, so I would not be surprised if it kind of sits still for a while, um, you know, because the U.S. is dealing with so many other things. What do you think? I don't see a coherent Africa policy, just like I don't see a coherent China policy. And I think this is one of the concerns in the Mideast as well now with the Iran uh, standoff, that there are a lot of tactics, but not grand strategies. And that is, I think, the concern that a lot of observers of American foreign policy have about uh, the current administration. At the same time, we do see a much tighter vision of foreign policy built around Belt and Road, built around expanding trade from the Chinese. And let's not overstate the Chinese. Oftentimes, I think the Chinese get more credit than they deserve for strategy. And maybe the United States gets more you know, criticism for its lack of strategy. We're probably somewhere in the middle of those two. But I think those are the broad strokes of the narratives, that at least there does seem to be a strategy built around Belt and Road for the Chinese in Africa, Whereas the Americans right now, I think it's very, very disjointed. Is it, the, is it a military? Is it development-led? Is it diplomatically-led? We don't really know. And, and that's really one of the concerns, so, uh, or at least one of the issues from the American side. Let's go on to our second story of the year that you see kind of dominating the headlines. Go. Number two, Cobus. What's, what's yours? Last year, we've seen um, China experimenting with a bunch of new approaches to public diplomacy. Um, so in the past, we always, you know, saw Af um, African ambassadors, or to, like, I mean Chinese ambassadors in Africa, to uh, mostly speaking only to the official Chinese press. So it's like lots of very boring interviews with CCTV. Now, suddenly, they're all on Twitter. Um, they're picking fights with African politicians on Twitter. They are picking fights with the U.S. on Twitter. Um, and so, so there seems to be a, a, a real move towards new forms of public diplomacy. Um, at the same time, you see, as these very, very kind of critical broadsides against the U.S. policy on Hong Kong, for example, are suddenly appearing on um, on China's African embassy Twitter pages, I think it's difficult for the U.S. to decide how to respond to this kind of criticism. Um, diplomats that I've spoke with in, in South Africa have said that they, they, they are at the moment not actively not responding to it. They don't want to get into a Twitter spat with the Chinese em you know, ambassador. Um, but at some stage, you're going to have to do something um, because otherwise the, the Chinese are just going to completely own this, this public diplomacy space. Um, at, this, at the same time, um, you also see uh, a move towards using Chinese private corporations um, as part of of public diplomacy initiatives. Um, so the company Star Times, for example, which provides satellite TV, is involved in a project called the 10,000 Villages Project, uh, which is rolling out satellite TV provision at very low cost to very poor communities in East and West and now also Southern Africa. Um, so you see, it's it's a... It's a private corporation. It's it's a profit-making corporation, but at the same time, it's 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 kind of dovetailed, folded into um, Chinese public diplomacy initiatives at the same time. So there's a lot of interesting developments on public diplomacy in Africa, and I think a, what frequently happens is that Africa is a kind of a testing ground. So what works in Africa then is rolled out in other parts of the global south too. So this might be the, the early movement of, of, of a really of a sea change in the way that, that China deals with public diplomacy um, and which might leave both Europe and the US n needing to develop new initiatives. So if you, have, if you have the perception that there's more Chinese diplomatic activity on Twitter and you're not really sure about it, the numbers are there to confirm that. So the BBC put out a chart that said in 2017... There were seven official Twitter accounts from embassies or diplomats, just seven. 2018, it went to six, so we went down. In 2019, there are 32. <laughs> so we have 19 diplomats and 13 embassies or consulates. Interestingly, Cobus, as you pointed out, a lot of things happen in Africa. First, a good number of those 32 are actually in Africa. 
So number one is you're seeing embassies and diplomats, diplomats like Ambassador Lin Songtian in South Africa, the Kenyan embassy in Nairobi, I'm sorry, the Chinese embassy in Nairobi, the Chinese embassy in Uganda, Angola, uh, they're all on Twitter. It's interesting because while Wu Peng, who is the ambassador in Kenya, he does not have his own official Twitter account, but the embassy's account is kind of serving as his de facto Twitter account. And as you pointed out, they are doing a lot more with their Twitter accounts than I think what traditional public diplomacy has used Twitter in the past. So the average American or European ambassador, they use it as a form of very rather staid type of communications, ribbon cutting, celebrities come through town, the ambassador goes to this youth event, and it's all kind of, I don't know, boring. It's not very engaging. Nobody really gets excited about looking at a U.S. ambassador's Twitter account or the French ambassador's Twitter account. The Chinese, as you pointed out, are using their Twitter accounts in a much more, so we say, dynamic way. I mean, Ambassador Lin in South Africa is on a rampage. I mean, this guy, he's calling the Americans evil. He's really going after the media. And this is really using undiplomatic language. And I think the very conservative world of diplomacy is being shaken up a little bit here, that the the standards are changing. Ironic as it is, Cobus, that the United States is led by a man who is a Twitter first, you know, politician. And it's ironic in some ways that the Americans are struggling to come up with a response. Well, they don't have a response right now, given that they are led by a man who has perfected the art of using Twitter in politics. So I'm surprised, to be honest with you, that we're not seeing more from uh, other leaders to at least confront the Chinese, because as you pointed out, giving someone like Ambassador Lin this much space to, to move on Twitter without having any repercussion seems to me, in a communications context, that you are affording a lot of space to go unchecked by, say, rivals or competitors. Certainly, yeah. if Coke was attacking Pepsi on Twitter, Pepsi would retaliate. Yes. There's no no doubt. I think, again, as you pointed out, the, the Americans and the Europeans and the, the targets of Chinese ire will have to find a way to respond or else they will simply cede this space to the Chinese. Ironic as it is, this is a social media service that is banned in China today. And yet the Chinese now have embraced it. And they did not embrace it in 2019, to be clear. They embraced it really in the third and fourth quarters of 2019. This was a sudden light switch on. Like all of a sudden, from one day to the next, we had, you know, 10 new accounts that just popped up out of nowhere. So this is really very, very new, very, very interesting. It's something that we have been covering in our daily newsletter uh, very, very close because the minute by minute is happening so fast. And, you know, in, I think it was November or December. I don't remember the date, Kobus, but I just went over to the, uh, the Zimbabwe embassy Twitter feed and the most remarkable thing happened. <laughs> All of a sudden, the Chinese embassy is negotiating with the Zimbabwean government over Twitter. Yes. You know, at it's finance crazy. minister Zim, you know, please review the document. And <laughs> the Zimbabwe minister is like, at embassy China, you know, you, you know, bam, back and <laughs> forth on Twitter. It was the most remarkable thing. And, and these are things that you have to sit at and look at every single day to catch. So that's one of the things that we're doing in our newsletter every day is that I get paid to sit and look at Chinese Twitter feeds in, in Africa. And so if you have time to do that, well, then mazel tov to you. But, it, you know, it's not something that most people have time for. But it is a remarkable evolution on diplomacy and what we're calling now twitplomacy. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really interesting. So what is... Okay, so now it's my turn on my second story. It's a slight... Similar to what you're doing, but I'm going to say tech in general is going to be a key theme of this year. So certainly twitplomacy is part of the story, but really the tech story is going to just explode, I think. And, and we, we saw a ramp up in the fourth quarter of 2019 with Chinese venture capital money coming into Africa for the first time in significant amounts. So almost a quarter billion dollars of Chinese investment in fintech and in Lori Systems, which was a Kenya-based transportation uh, startup, is really starting to come in in a significant, meaningful way that's really changing the narrative of tech in Africa. And it brings up the interesting point, Kobus, that the Chinese are building up 
such a formidable lead in many tech sectors in Africa. So whether it's Boomplay, which is a Transin NetEase joint venture, uh, both Chinese companies in the, who are now dominating the music space with 62 million subscribers, or Transin and its brand of phones that are dominating the uh, the mobile phone space, to the new fintech investments, to the hardware investments that Huawei has made and ZTE have made. There are so many sectors of the tech economy in Africa now that the Chinese have critical mass that will be very, very difficult for anybody to challenge. And now with a whole lot of money starting to come in, it's going to make that lead potentially insurmountable in some areas, at least for the near term. Nothing in tech is permanent, but that being said, when your network infrastructure is built by one company and then your apps are built by another and your and the phone and the hardware is built by another, all from the same country, we get to the issue of standards. And when we think of Africa, standards are going to be everything. And so standards in terms of 5G, standards in terms of cryptocurrency, these are all going to be proprietary standards. And the more that Africa is aligned with the Chinese technology standards, it will make it more difficult for other standards to emerge and make their way in. And I think 2020 is going to be a critical year in that. I also think so. Um, it's, it's very interesting how the Chinese have been able to really focus on the power of African consumers um, to really think about Africa as an emerging market um, rather than, say, as, a, as a, an aid project or such, you know, a group of people that need to be helped. It's simply a, a group of people you can sell stuff to and how successful that has been. So, you know, Transian, who, uh, who is largely unknown in China, um, a mobile phone producer, and which now um, occupies about 40% um, of the African phone ma mobile phone market, um, did did uh, had a, a massive IPO this year, um, completely, basically, is essentially solely um, based on on its profits that it's making in Africa. It doesn't have a big presence in China, um, so you know that that alone is a real you know indicator of of the kind of money that can be made in Africa if you work with African consumers if you really target what they need. Um, at the same time, I think you know it's. Again, you know, so much of what, what China rolls out in the rest of the global south gets road tested in Africa first. Um, Transien is already move, making a big move into India. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's interested, I think, in, in road testing or, or, or taking some of the stuff that it road tested in Africa into other global south markets. Um, and that itself is a very intriguing model, I think. Um, because increasingly, I think, you know, the, still the largest number of people on Earth are in the global south. Um, so for cer in certain sectors, even though that's a relatively low income group of people, it still is a significant and large group of people. So, you know, for, for certain, for companies in certain sectors of the tech industry, that is a very interesting model, I think, to look at. So that is the exciting, upbeat part of the China-Africa tech story. There's a more concerning part that I also want to address. So it is the exporting of the Chinese approach to censorship. Uh, I'm trying to find the right words of what Nigeria wants to propose with its new social media law and what Zimbabwe is also in the process of enacting with its regulatory oversight with the government basically is going to start censoring vast parts of Zimbabwe social media content if it finds it offensive to the government, if it slanders people. There's all sorts of different rules. And what it's emulating in many ways is the Chinese control of the internet. And so there is some inspiration that's coming in from that. Then combine with that the exporting of Chinese surveillance technology in Africa. Now, again, lots of countries are exporting surveillance technology. China is by no means alone in this market. A lot of the attention is paid to companies like Huawei and their smart cities programs. Uh, they deserve a lot of scrutiny. But at the end of the day, Americans, Israelis, Italians, a lot of European countries are also exporting surveillance technology. I contend that the burden should not necessarily be on the vendor and the, the vending country, but on the buyer. That we should be looking at African governments who are buying this technology and then deploying it against their own people in many respects. But that is the concerning side of the China-Africa tech relationship, where we're seeing the governance model or at least inspiration from the Chinese internet governance model now make its way 
to portions of Africa and at the same time the surveillance technology. Give us a, a little bit of your sense on these on these disconcerting trends that we're seeing in terms of internet freedom. These are frequently couched in terms of China exporting its authoritarian internet model to the rest of the world. Um, and as you said, I think more questions should be asked about the choices of individual African governments. I think it's really important um, for the continent to set some kind of um, of roadmap towards a, a shared idea of what Africa wants from in, in, in tech governance. Um, you know, as the, as the continent moves towards greater trade integration uh, through the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it's going to need greater integration uh, and greater shared decision-making on these standards as well, not least because e-commerce is, is you, you know, frequently predicted to be a major um, mover in, in African development. So that's going to be really important for the for the continent to really decide what it wants and how it wants to run things. The um, I think there's also another problem, and this is a this is a key problem, is that Africa is you know. You know, I, I say this so many times, but Africa is the world's youngest population with the world's oldest leaders. So there's a, a massive gap between um, between the population who I think is burning for more internet access and who is already now even you know, even at great challenges and and you know at very low levels of of skills and 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 capacity and resources is already there's already a a kind of a nascent coding movement and a kind of like little micro Silicon Valleys popping up in different African cities. You know, you Africa is already a leader in, in mobile financial technology, um, for example. So there's definitely a, a, a strong move in that direction. Some, and that's something that, that someone like Jack Ma from Alibaba has been picking up on. But at the same time, you have very old leaders who are mostly just worried about the internet boosting opposition politicians um, and who are, who are trying to kind of crack down and trying to, to control this rather than seeing it as, as this kind of, uh, you know, massive de developmental um, solution. So there are two, I think there's this, there are two um, philosophical approaches to the internet that are, that are completely different in Africa. Um, and, for Africa's future, the young person's approach, you know, kind of should take precedence. Um, but the old people are in control, you know. So, so that I think is is a is a big problem. So decisions that either this year, next year, or the year after, but sometime in the next few years, are that are going to have to be made, or else countries will start to lose their sovereignty in this space. Will involve data privacy, and right now we don't have any consistent data privacy rules in Africa. Things that are being discussed now in the state of California, this is in in the in Europe with GDPR and some of these other these other methods, there is no consistent data privacy. So what happens to all of African consumer data and all of that data that's being sucked up by the Huawei Smart Cities program, the surveillance data? We don't have any standards on that. Cryptocurrency. The Chinese are coming out with their cryptocurrency. They're going to want to deploy it. In places like Africa, where oftentimes, as Kobus, you pointed out, things happen first before it goes to other countries, look for companies like Transin to bring cryptocurrency onto their platform. Now, remember, Transin has 54, 55, 56% of the phone market, both smartphone and feature phone market in Africa. So it has walled gardens that it can now introduce technologies to with a built-in audience already. That's what it's doing with music. So if you want to purchase music, maybe you buy credits on Transin using the cryptocurrency. Again, the consumer may not know that they're using a cryptocurrency in the back end, but it's a Chinese cryptocurrency. What are the regulations for those cryptocurrencies? So all of that data, cryptocurrencies, technology standards, these are decisions that are coming now. And if African countries fail to make decisions about where that information lives and what the standards are, uh, the big companies will do that for them and just take it. And again, that comes down to then an individual, individual country's sovereignty being eroded. Um, so there's good and bad on the tech, just like there's good and bad on the energy side. Again, this kind of reflects in some ways the China-Africa story writ large. There is no good, there is no bad. It's really a mixed, a tossed salad of both. And you, depending on how you look at it, you can spin a narrative either way. Kobus, let's now go to our third and final round of trend stories, 
top stories, however you want to frame it for 2020. What's your third story for the year? The big trend for 2020 was also the big trend in 2019, which is debt. Um, it's debt is a big issue. It's always it's always part of a, the China Africa relationship because China funds so much infrastructure in Africa. Um, uh, but the changes come over the last two years or so as Western countries have started becoming a lot more critical about the impact of Chinese debt, um, and. You know, there, there are some reasons for concern. Um, African debt has increased sharply over the last while, um, and a big proportion of that debt is Chinese. Um, but generally, kind of a, a lot of Western commentators have largely ignored the complexities of, of, the, of Africa's debt mix in favor of what, what we've started to call the debt trap narrative, which is this idea that China is... is indebting poor countries on purpose in order to gain leverage and, and to, to do things like seize state assets. A lot of people have pushed back on this, particularly a lot of scholars have pushed back on this. Um, but we've, we're still seeing it. In 2019, we still saw it coming, you know, being, being mentioned by State Department officials. Um, I think it's a, it's a very uh, misleading way of putting it because one of Africa's problems is that it has a very, that it has a lot of debt from a lot of different debtors, not just from China. If Chinese debt were the only problem, that would be a, a problem you could deal with. The, the, the problem is that, that Africa has a lot of Eurobond debt, has a lot of debt from African lenders. Um, so, you know, the, the, the debt mix is complicated and it's growing very rapidly and that is a concern. But however, the other concern is that Africa... Um, finds it very difficult to to fund all of this infrastructure that it, that it has to fund and if it doesn't fund infrastructure that is its own problem you know kind of um, a lack of infrastructure especially with as young a population as africa um, means that it would be impossible to to develop the countries in time for these for by the time that these people need to enter the job market, and if if those people don't have jobs by the time they need to have jobs, that puts the entire country on a road to chaos and you know and instability. So there are very very large issues at play. Um, Africa needs debt. It, it needs to it needs to lend um, in order to build these these infrastructures. All of this infrastructure they need to build. Um, um, and China is going to be a massive um, lender into the future, even as China itself is starting to become more wary of its exposure to African debt. Um, so what we've seen in the last while is African leaders becoming a lot more... Um, a lot more assertive in pushing back against against you know kind of suggested limits coming from from the International Monetary Fund, for example, um, and we've also seen the development of new kinds of deals and uh, versions of of uh, public private partnerships um, in between uh, African governments and Chinese companies that are attempting to kind of spread the risk around a little bit that it doesn't all land on the African government. So I think debt is an old issue. But it's a new issue as well. It's it's renewing itself as we speak, and I think it's going to really be a, a, a dominant issue in the coming year. No doubt, and it's debt and deficit. So you raised this issue with the IMF and a group of West African leaders at the end of 2019 uh, really pushed back on the IMF on the three percent deficit limits that they have, and saying that they need to carry more debt and run budget deficits in order to fund the infrastructure. And again, we heard from African leaders the demographic pressure that they're under, that if they don't build this infrastructure now, not five, six, seven years from now, now, that they are not going to have the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the all of the equipment in place in order to build economies on that are going to employ the 15, 16, 17-year-olds of today in the next five to 10 years. And if you don't have that infrastructure, given what we know about the demographic trend lines, it is a recipe for unrest and social instability. Exactly. It's it's the difference between between being India and being Pakistan, right? Kind of it's the the, the difference between being this kind of global south developmental lodestar, um, you know, getting rich very quickly the way that India is, or this this country like Pakistan is where a large part of the population feels very stymied and in the process you then you get a lot of instability, a lot of very unhappy people, the the development of, of armed movements and so on and so on. 
Huh. I thought you were going to say the difference between India and China here, because when you look at India's infrastructure compared to China's infrastructure, both a country of a billion people, both in the global south, I mean, India's infrastructure is you know nowhere close. China itself has invested in infrastructure in a way that has facilitated its industrial growth. It wants to bring that model to parts of Africa as well. Your point on the new financing models, so look for the Chinese to be much more discriminating in what they finance. So the days of just the easy money coming through the China Exim Bank, I think, are over. So the Chinese have rejected Kenya's phase three of the SGR. They've rejected the Ugandan SGR. These are the railways. Uh, they're becoming much more disciplined about demanding feasible projects from African stakeholders. So that is going to be something very, very interesting to look ahead. And, and, and Uganda was very key in all of this because... They basically said, okay, we're not getting our money for our standard gauge railway from China. We're going to go look elsewhere. And they couldn't raise the money. So then they went back to China with a reduced proposal for money. And we're waiting to see what happens. But I think it proves that there really isn't a market out there to lend vast amounts of money for African infrastructure outside of China. Certainly the African Development Bank and some of the multilateral lending institutions are there, but not at the scale with which the Chinese are doing it at. So if the Chinese are able to evolve the resource for infrastructure deals that in many ways have not proven to be very productive for some countries, like Angola, which has created a capital crisis there due to the fact that Angola is selling most of its oil to China to pay off loans rather than to bring in currency into its economy and then keep inflation down, what we are seeing is they're going to move, as you talked about, into these kind of hybrid public-private partnership deals. But I suspect they're going to be different public-private partnership deals than what they are accountable or are used to, accustomed to in the West. So the United States is proposing for an expressway in Nairobi to do a public-private partnership deal that has run into a whole lot of speed bumps. And the problem with the public-private partnership deals is that you have a greater number of stakeholders involved. And what happens, Cobus, in Africa when you have more people involved? More money goes into people's pockets. So the cost went up considerably on that public-private partnership expressway in Nairobi for, that the Americans are behind, and it's effectively halted or stalled right now. So this is one of the concerns that this is one of the benefits of the Chinese doing these opaque deals between Chinese elites and African elites. They're terrible in many other ways. Without having the oversight, without having audit, without having any kind of transparency. But in one particular way, they were very good at getting stuff done. Because the number of people that were involved limited the amount of corruption that was exposed to, to a certain project. Now, I'm not suggesting that we go back to doing that. But by expanding out the number of stakeholders, it does run the risk of slowing down the development of what we've seen over the past 10 years, which has been breakneck, lightning fast infrastructure development in Africa using Chinese money. So just something to think about on that front, you know, but infrastructure is really tied to debt. So my third in our, you know, story of the year is less about debt, but it is about infrastructure. So it's connected in some ways. Cobus, I am talking about railways and roadways. 2020 is going to be the year that significant changes happen in the African transportation space. We're seeing now the emergence of an SGR network start to take place. The first international railways in Africa in the modern era I mean, we haven't had one since the Tazara which, that connected Tanzania and Zambia, built by the Chinese, ironically, you know, two generations ago. But up until then, a railway in Africa was built entirely by, at that time, the colonial power that went to the border. And then as soon as it crossed into another country, the gauge of the railway changed. So literally, you could not move goods and people from one country to the next. Now, though, with the emergence of standard gauge railways, a standard gauge, that's what it's called, people and goods are crossing borders, and 2020, I think, will be a pivotal year, as particularly in East Africa, where cross-border networks are starting to take shape. Obviously, Kenya has been the first to go, but I'm starting to think that Kenya now will not be the hub that it hoped it would become, linking East Africa into the port of Mombasa 
with its railway systems. I think now the smart money is going to Tanzania, where President John Magafuli is striking one deal after another with East African countries, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and others to make all of that go through Tanzania is the port of Bagamayo and the port at Dar es Salaam. But either way, we're starting to see the emergence of cross-border rail networks, again, coming at huge expense. One of the stories just this week that came out was that the five-year grace period for the Kenya loan on its first SGR phase, that's a $3.6 billion Mombasa to Nairobi train line, the Kenyan government now is preparing to transfer $98 million dollars to the China Exim Bank. That will happen maybe by the time that the show is out. That's real money in Kenya. Real money. That's a lot of money. And they've got $3.5 billion to go. So the, the checks are now being cut to send money back to China. So it's coming at great expense. But I would argue that it's an absolutely essential piece of... Africa's economic development is you got to have logistic costs come down. And rail is a very good way to do that. And roads as well. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, kind of when you speak to Africa development people, they, you know, this this is the, the theme that they hit over and over, that it's, it you know, the, the continent won't move ahead if it doesn't integrate its economies. If, you know, if, if they don't have supply chains that, that draw in several countries within a regional economic community, um, without, you know, if, if it's not possible for African companies to produce stuff in one country and then get it to another country. Keep in mind that it's still impossible to just simply get in a car and drive from East Africa to West Africa. You know, that's still, that, that alone is still impossible. Um, and the, you know, kind of the old um, World Bank statistic that it's, that it's cheaper to ship a car from Japan to, to Kenya than it is to get it from Kenya to Nigeria. Um, you know, those, all of those, those costs and those logistical nightmares that take weeks to work out, those need to go, you know, if Africa wants to develop. And without infrastructure, they, they will permanently become a fixture of, of the African landscape. Um, so it's, and, but it's, it's difficult because A, it's incredibly expensive and B, it has to happen within a, a relatively short time, you know, in order to, to, to really take, advantage of Africa's demographic boom. Um, so so these, these governments are under a lot of pressure. And in a lot of cases, you know, they, they're signing deals that consign generations of, of, of their countries in the future to paying back these massive loans. That's an interesting point you bring up in terms of the loans here, because the next generation won't be paying back these loans, but their children will still be paying back these loans. This is going to go two or three generations down now. That being said, Kobus, I read a statistic this year that Germany had to spend $18 billion to subsidize its rail network. And I guess my point here is that every country has to spend to subsidize its infrastructure. There's just no way. These are not things that generate profit by themselves. Rail networks do not generate profit. So when you hear Americans lecturing people about you know, the debt to build the SGR, ask them how much money American Congress, the United States Congress, has spent on Amtrak. Amtrak has not made a profit, as far as I know, in my lifetime, and I'm here almost, you know, 50 years. <laughs> so, but what it does, though, is it creates the opportunity, the hubs, and the facility for others to make profit, and overall the economy then grows. So what I get frustrated is when I hear Americans and Europeans talk about the debt, they're not coming up with an alternative solution. Sure, don't borrow money to build rail networks, but then What? I mean, you have the Continental Free Trade Agreement now that's going into force, but if you can't move a good between a border, what's the point of having a free trade agreement, right? Exactly. Yeah. So those are the issues. That's, that's, you know, we need, and we need to evolve the international discussion about the Chinese in Africa beyond the debt trap narrative. It needs to come with, okay, if you're not going to take Chinese money, then who's going to provide the money to build this infrastructure? Let's get down to brass tacks. And I hope that Africans will start to push back on U.S. and European critics on this front to say, we get it. The Chinese may not be the best people to borrow money from for all sorts of reasons. But until you provide me with an alternative, I got nowhere else to go. And interestingly, Kobus, one of the things we heard in a lot of our interviews last year in 2019 
was speed. Ghana was the best example of that. 18 months from the time that they started the conversations between Sinohydro and the Ghanaian government over the bauxite deal. 18 months was the amount of time it took between the deal start and shovels in the ground to build that infrastructure. We heard it in Wu Peng's interview with Dickens Olewe from the BBC, where he said, young Africans want action. And I think that's absolutely true. Teenagers, by definition, are not the most patient people in the world. <laughs> and what, Africa is a continent of teenagers. In Nigeria, what, the median age is 15? So people want to see action. And I was in Washington last week. And you cross one of the bridges. I don't know the name of the bridge. And I asked somebody how long they've been building that. And they said, this bridge has been under development, under construction. They're refurbishing it. They're expanding the lanes on it. Anybody in Washington will know exactly what I'm talking about. But they said, it's been years. You know, that's the way we do things in the U.S. It, we don't build infrastructure fast because we have to do environmental impact reports, community assessments, we have to do sustainability reports. There has to be all these different kind of boxes that are checked. And African leaders will tell you, I ain't got time for that. There is just no time for that. So people will say, Sh you know, were shortcuts taken in the bauxite deal in Ghana? Probably, but there are shovels in the ground now and roads are being built and things are happening and that's what people wanna see. So the debt, the infrastructure, the impatience of teenagers, all of this gets wrapped together. Final thoughts to you, Cobus. You know, the, the thing is that, that the continent itself, I think at the moment, is going through a, a lot of these changes. And a, these, these kind of priorities are becoming stated more explicitly. Um, and on the commercial side, you're seeing the rapid, rapid development of, of, of companies, startups, and so on in Africa, trying to do exactly this, trying to move forward in a very innovative, innovative, innovative way um, and very quickly. Um, I think the, the, the problem is, is all of the, the kind of um, friction that's built into the African system because of the role of officials, because of the role of corruption. Um, and, you know, so there's certain kind of inertia that's built into the system that that the population of the country or, or the, of the continent is trying to fight against, and so it's it's very easy for external um, actors or external partners to to also be become stuck in this kind of inertia, and it's really important for them to connect with the right Africans, the right actors in Africa. Um, in you know, in order to 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 really to to fulfil this need to move ahead more quickly and more efficiently, um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities. I think this this is one thing that I think 2019 has shown is that there's it is possible to make money in Africa, um, and it is possible to make money in Africa outside of simply you know kind of taking raw minerals and selling it in the, on the international market. Um, it is possible to make money in Africa out of tech by engaging with African consumers, you know, in all of these different ways. There's a, there's a million different opportunities. It's just, it's, it's, it's a last mile problem frequently. It's, you know, it's, it's trying to make those final connections, trying to get the way of doing it that, that makes sense in the environment and that is actually payable. Um, and I think so far the Chinese have been very effective at taking advantage of some of these opportunities. I think in cases where a lot of Western actors didn't even see opportunities. Um, and I think it is gonna, it's the, you know, what, what I, when I'm optimistic, I hope that there will be a wider range of people, both Chinese and non Chinese, Western and non Western partners kind of stepping up and, and seeing these opportunities and actually taking advantage of them. Um, at the moment, I'm not really seeing it in the, on, you know, in places like Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I think I think there's still a very low interest, very low awareness of 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 the the very rapid developments that are happening in Africa. And and I hope that the, the 2020s will be a moment when more people start waking up to what the potential is. Well, we are going to be there to cover it all. We are expanding what we're doing. 
Uh, so in addition to the weekly podcasts, you may notice in your podcast feed, we're adding in some extra shows on Tuesday. So we're publishing on definitely on every Friday, but also now on alternating Tuesdays as well. We've got our daily newsletter, our weekly newsletter. We've got some exciting initiatives underway in the health and agricultural space that we're going to talk about later. We're going to do more sustainability and climate coverage. So what began 10 years ago as not knowing if there was going to be enough content for us to cover will now just hopefully just expand a lot more in 2020. So all of the things that we've covered here in our discussion today on the stories ahead, we're going to bring you more of on the China Africa Project. We hope that you will become a subscriber. And in becoming a subscriber, you're doing two things that are very, very important. Number one, you're supporting independent journalism. Uh, we are effectively the only resource right now in the world that covers China-Africa relations dedicated daily, and that's all we do. So if you rely on mainstream media, say the New York Times, The Guardian, AP, Reuters, any of those sources, or Business Daily, any of the South African media outlets, or places like in Kenya, in Nigeria, Premium, Premium Times, etc., uh, you'll get some China-Africa coverage, there's no doubt. They'll give you the big picture of things, but they're not going to give you the day-to-day. -day. We give you the day-to-day, -day, and we do it independent. We're not supported by any country, country, culture, or company. Uh, so we depend on your support through subscription. So we hope that you'll check us out at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. And then we're also going to make sure that we elevate the discourse and we try to bring in all voices. And that's really something very, very important that we're not simply relying on Westerners. We're not relying on traditional China-Africa voices, but also as Kobus has been mentioning over and over and over again, Africa is a continent of young people. We're bringing in African youth and also to bring in Chinese youth as well into this discussion who often get overshadowed by state media and the older voices, if you will. So we have this great dynamic conversation going on. Check us out at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Of course, Kobus and I are always available to you, our listeners. If you would like to reach us, just email us, eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com. And I have finally fixed Kobus's email. Kobus at ChinaAfricaProject.com now works. So if you'd like to comment, question, give Kobus any kind of feedback, criticize, we do like that too. Uh, keep it clean. That's all we ask. Uh, then uh, please email us directly. So we'll be back with a whole year ahead now of shows coming up in 2020. We want to thank you all for your support over the years, over these past 10 years, in fact. Many of you have been loyal listeners from the very beginning. And for those of you who are new to the program, we're hopefully going to keep you for another 10 years to keep listening to us. So until next week, thank you so much for listening. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at e Olander, And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.